Hey, this is Larry Levin, and welcome to another edition of Cop Talk. Here with Bob Cohn, editor in chief emeritus of the Jewish Light. We're here to talk about issues of the day. Welcome again. Well, nice to be here. So you wrote a great column this week, wrapping your arms around many of the issues uh, surrounding the war in Libya. Yes. Uh, and I agreed with some, disagreed with some, mm -hmm. and I know you're going to seek some input from those with different perspectives Absolutely. in the community. But here's my question for you: uh, France now says the campaign could take days or weeks. In Iraq, we know it took uh, a decade, yes. and in Afghanistan, we're still trying. So even if one believes it's right to intervene, where do we draw the line on our financial commitment when we're trying to get out of a deep economic hole at home? Well, you know, that, that's a question raised by, of all people, John Boehner. Uh, and the Republicans, of course, approved the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, right. which are extremely costly, and add yet another one. So that certainly needs to be factored. So what do you think? How do you figure out how to draw that line? You, you know, John, Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes says we have a difficult issue. You draw the line in the right place. <laughs> Finding that right place is going to be uh, difficult. But we still have troops in Germany. Yeah. We have them in Japan. We have them in Korea. But we never seem to fully, do, even after the so-called withdrawal in Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. So I think this thing is kind of going to be open-ended. And uh -huh. not, every, not all the allies, quote-unquote, are on the same page. So one thing the U.S. has tried to do is to push others to take the lead this time, right? Exactly, exactly. Do you and think I, that will be a successful endeavor? Well, you know, France, in a sense, did take the lead from the get-go. Yeah. So they were going forward even without our help. Napoleon said, don't give me a country to fight. Give me a coalition to fight. Mm -hmm. That's easy to defeat. Yeah. You can see the fractures within the coalition. So at the same time, we have this terrific bomb blast in central Jerusalem, and that suggests an effort to undermine stability during these kind of uh, vastly changing times in the Middle East. So Arab states now uh, that may be under more democratic and less dictatorial leadership will have to decide quickly if they're part of the problem or the solution. So where's your money? Well, I was very encouraged by the prime minister of the Palestinian Authority, Fayyad, who was the guy in the West Bank, right. says, that he denounced it in no uncertain terms and said it undermines the Palestinian cause. And I'm placing a lot of my chips, and I know you feel largely the same way, on this guy and hope that some kind of a deal could be struck with him on a two-state solution, uh, even with all this other uh, violence. Right. I mean, the problem is that he's new school, and, and obviously Abbas is old school yes. and, and, and a colleague of Arafat. So, so I mean, where does this take us? I mean, how do they decide whether to go forward or go, or go backwards? Well, you know, elections are scheduled in the PA right. for September. Right. Hopefully somebody like Fayyad will emerge as the stronger guy. Even somebody like Barghouti, who's a harder line guy, might be a more effective person to deliver a deal. Yeah. Abbas is almost as charismatic as a discarded mannequin. Oh, I, th I think you're being more. kind, actually. Exactly. And what about in Gaza? Do you see any hope in terms of a more, uh, more progressive leadership or not? Well, if there were true elections in both Gaza and the West Bank, I think Gaza would, uh, Hamas would lose this, uh, this round. Um, another thing that relates to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is this new flick that's uh, coming out uh, called Miral, which is directed yes. by Julian Schnabel, the artist and uh, artist come filmmaker, I guess is yes. the way I would put it. Um, and it's dedicated, quote, to everyone on both sides who believe peace is still possible. It's taken a lot of heat from more conventional Jewish sources, right. um, but it's also received some praise. For instance, um, Rabbi Erwin Kula, who we both respect greatly, yes. has suggested that the ongoing conflict between Israelis and Palestinians kind of crowds out the ability to tell human stories. Um, my question to you is, why can't an artist tell whatever story he or she wants to tell? Isn't that what art's for? Absolutely, and even things that I find vehemently objectionable, I think, are fair game in the, in the marketplace of ideas, and then critics such as Alan Futterman here, I've written some reviews, you have too, we have the perfect right to take issue with it. I saw a piece that was highly critical of this project in Newsweek, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a greater degree of credibility there than a critique in a typically Jewish source. When you hear about something, not you, Bob, but when, when you or people, many the many you know in the Jewish community, does there tend to be a bit of a knee-jerk reaction like, Oh, how could you possibly tell this story that focuses favorably, you know, on a Palestinian and shows Israelis as the aggressors? There's something that's got to be wrong about there that. There is that tendency, and I will confess to having a little bit of that initial reaction to things like the uh, Klinghoffer opera that's coming. Yeah, the same and world. we're going to talk a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Making that a major focus. But sometimes one is surprised. I mean, Munich, people complained about Munich because they showed Palestinians' fathers and daughters, and they were human beings. Right. Uh, so I think that there is a balance to be struck here in favor of freedom of expression artistically. Whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. Um, okay, since we're in the arts, it's now time to embarrass yourself by talking about your age-old love affair with Elizabeth Taylor. 
so who passed away this yeah. week. So um, and her Jewish connections. So the greatest film reviewer of all time was James A. G. Mm -hmm. who, uh, who wrote the great Nation, playwright, the great playwright, and the great essayist. Mm -hmm. uh, he said when he saw her for the first time on screen, I uh, have to say that I found her rapturously beautiful. So much so that I don't really know or care whether she can act. <laughs> but not only could she act, she was nominated five times, received two Oscars, one for Butterfield Eight, the other for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. She also converted to Judaism, not for Eddie Fisher, but for Mike Todd, mm -hmm. and she embraced it fully. She sold many of her diamonds and gave the proceeds to help Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Uh, she refused to cow tow to the Egyptians when she did Cleopatra, who when they objected to her support right. for Israel. Right. Uh, she was a real. I mean, she supported HIV/AIDS, and she was also rapture. I mean, those violet eyes were one of a kind. Can you think back to? Do you remember vividly the first time you saw National Velvet? I remember uh, first time I saw a cat on a hot tin roof. Okay. I saw that before I, I was, you know, kind of little when yeah, yeah, National yeah. Velvet came out. Yeah. I have seen it since. It's you were since. little. At one time it was little, yeah. Back in the we're not going to edit that part out. No, absolutely, the Cenozoic era. Uh, uh -huh. No, but you remember Cat on a Hot Tin Roof as being the first. I, not only me, but the, my fraternity brothers. Oh my gosh, there's Liz, and they just kept talking about Liz as being the platinum standard of gorgeousness. It's almost hard to convey uh, in this day and age what it meant, you know, because today we're focused on so many different stars, so many different yes. strands of, of of popular culture. And, and, and at, the, at the time that she was initially a star, everybody was focused on the one new thing. And by the way, Dick Cavett was on with Piers Morgan last night, and he said she was the last of the Redwoods. Marlon Brando and, and all that whole Catherine Hepper, that entire generation of megastore, not just superstars. When everybody looked to just these few people. For right, sure. Exactly. That's all we got time for this week. Thanks for joining us for Cop Talk. We'll see you next time. Thanks.